Well, ladies and gentlemen, please stay for the closing keynote. We've got an exciting speaker, Dr. Philip Wong, uh, Professor of Electrical Engineering at Stanford and formerly the VP R&D at TSMC. So you'd really like to probably want to hear his views and opinions. Dr. Wang. Well, good morning. I'm standing between you and lunch, so I will be brief. So I want to talk about AI in fields manufacturing, and uh, especially about high-tech manufacturing when you are a technology leader. I'm not talking about manufacturing of shoes and things like that, but rather technology that is really sophisticated. And you know, I, I had my background on semiconductors, so I'll use that as an example of what I mean by, uh, by high-tech manufacturing. Okay, so here's the quote from uh, President, uh, U.S. President uh, uh, Joe Biden, and uh, he made that uh, statement during the opening of a two-in ceremony of the TSMC Fab in Arizona. And he said, I quote, uh, high-tech manufacturing in the U.S. is going to create thousands of good manufacturing jobs, 90% uh, of which won't require a college degree, and yet you get a good wage. I don't know what he's smoking. Uh, to me, that doesn't make a lot of sense, okay? If you look at the employee profile of the, uh, of the TSMC today, 75% uh, of the employees, total, 75% of the employees have a bachelor's degree and above, 50% of the employees have master's degree and above. So you really need a high-tech workforce for a technology leader that is involved in high-tech manufacturing. Just to home in the kind of key in on this point again, if you go back to in time, if you look at uh, TSMC as an example, they have been publishing this data since 1999. In 1999, uh, in, when the data was uh, first available, 20% of the people, of the employee, have a bachelor's degree in about. And over the course of time, as the technology level, the leadership advances over time, that 20% becomes 80%. So by now, it's totally flipped. So as you see, if you're talking about high-tech manufacturing, if you're talking about being a technology leader, your workforce needs to come along with it. You have to have a high-skilled workforce. Now, that is a statement of the fact that manufacturing and R&D really can't go hand in hand. You cannot have high-tech manufacturing unless you have good R&D. And you cannot have, because you need to have the next generation product that is a leader of your uh, product. And on the other hand, you cannot do good R&D unless you know what you're doing in a manufacturing floor. Because all the key problems, how to get from 90% yield to 99% yield, occurs on the manufacturing floor. So if you don't have a high skill uh, workforce, you cannot do that. So that's a very important thing to, to, to understand. High-tech manufacturing is basically, and R&D goes hand in hand. All right, so focusing on something that I know about, uh, semiconductor manufacturing. That's today's fab. You can see almost lights out. Nobody in the fab, basically. All right, everything is on a control room somewhere. Uh, and, uh, and not only that, today, unfortunately, we still have some, a lot of, involve a lot of high school labor, uh, because that's why we need uh, a lot of them. And what do they do? Every morning, they get up, uh, get into the, uh, uh, get into, uh, the, uh, the factory, and meet up, and open up the computer, look at uh, statistical process chart, uh, chart SBC charts, and try to decide what to do. Uh, they're in the excursion somewhere last night, or something happened, some two drifted away, then some engineers with great experience will say, ah, I've seen this before, let's do that. I think we have to do better. Uh, this is the 21st century, we have generative AI, we have AI, we have machine learning. There's a lot of things that we could do to make this a lot better than what we are today. Because today, we are depending a lot on the human experience, which is really valuable. That can assist, and, uh, and AI could assist many of this human uh, knowledge. And also, people come and go. You know, engineers leave, experienced engineers leave, and those knowledge needs to be captured and could be captured by advances in AI and machine learning. 
So going forward, the semiconductor manufacturing auto uh, really will adopt oh, a more AI-infused uh, type manufacturing, and part of that is instantiated in something called digital twin. And uh, some of you may have seen the Department of Commerce, NIST has put out a notice of intent to create a Manufacturing USA Institute on digital twin. And so you may ask, well, what is, well, digital twin mean, means many things to many people from the basic material discovery to modeling the process, uh, unit processes and stringing the processes and tools together into a full flow, uh, partial flow, and then full flow, and then going off on to, to uh, factory optimization and even supply chain and materials control and so on. It means many things to many people. But what you can expect to have is that A, be able to model the physical processes and the devices, so then you could know if there is a change in the processes, and you would know what the implications are. That's very important because a lot of times in semiconductor manufacturing, probably in other manufacturing as well, that a step that you do today, may, the effect may not show up until maybe like 50 steps later. And you want to know that ahead of time. And having enough understanding about uh, the, the, the models of the manufacturing processes, understanding about uh, history and data collection, you can, learn, uh, you can learn these things. You can learn that if something happened now, maybe 50 steps later, something bad is going to happen, even though I don't know it by now. So that's very important. Modeling uh, devices and specific processes, and then that would accelerate process and uh, device discovery. And you want to make a new device or you want to make the device better. So you would be able to learn from those data and so on. And of course, tool development, uh, the, because all the manufacturing have tools and the new tool development is really the enabler for next generation technology. So how do you develop your tools so that you can, en that could enable the fabrication of next generation technology that requires different capability, a better capability. So t new tool development would be accelerated. And of course, uh, option evaluation, um, oh, I have, a fleet of tools in here, and I want to replace this tool. Well, what, do I, what does that mean uh, to my overall yield if I replace that tool? And uh, so, a very simple example like that. Uh, reliability, interoperability, cost reduction, and uh, factory optimization, all these things can be done. And uh, within that, uh, if you have a good model of not only the unit processes and the tools itself, but also all the way to stringing the tools together into a complete process and into factory optimization. Now, some of these are being done today. Uh, all the fabs today are collecting tons of data and uh, learning from those data and, uh, and uh, using those data to predict outcome. A very simple example today uh, for those who are in the semiconductor business is we don't need to cut transition, uh, uh, transmission electron microscope uh, pictures that often anymore. Uh, oftentimes you have a wafer, you don't cut and cut a cross section and look at what's inside. It's a very tedious, long process and very expensive process. But today, you are able to do what we call virtual TEM, virtual transmission electron microscope. Uh, because we have cut so many of these things at the same location based on the correlation between the two conditions and process conditions, I know what the result's going to be because I have zillions of data in the past. So a new wave will come in, I can look, just look at the two conditions, I can predict what that uh, picture is going to look like. I don't need to actually cut it. So this, is happen this has happened already, it's being used, and more of the same thing, more of the similar things will, will be gradually being used, and AI, machine learning, inferencing uh, will be more and more used. For example, in uh, circuit design, uh, you, do, you design your circuits, you place your circuit here, and you, generally you use the EDA tool to do place and route. Uh, now you can use uh, machine learning to do place and route, and that uh, could be uh, better than what you do by, by human interacting with the ADA tool sometimes. All right, so this is um, uh, uh, happening. So going forward, this will, this will be even more uh, uh, spread out uh, 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 to the rest of the uh, semiconductor supply chain. All right, so I would like to paint a picture for the future of how 
new technology will be developed in the future. So I talk about manufacturing floor, and I also mentioned that manufacturing and R&D go together. So we need to figure out how do we accelerate our R&D. Uh, today, um, if, for example, if I, I work at Stanford, so if I want to go to talk to my friends at Berkeley, I drive up the, uh, the, the bay and go to Berkeley, and I want, and of course, the traffic conditions is, uh, has changed uh, every day. Sometimes you go through 101 is better. Sometimes you go to 880. Sometimes you go some other way. Or you go to 280 across the Bay Bridge. So you consult Google Map and say, hey, okay, where are, the where are the cars being uh, uh, stuck in here? Where, where are the congestion? And you get your best route to go from A to B. Okay, that's how we do that today. Okay, that's Google Map. Now, going forward, I will, uh, but the, the vision is that uh, I, let's say I have an idea. I want to build a device that looks like this, you know, build 3D, this way, that way, nano sheet, nano wire, whatever it is, and I want to build this thing. How do I do that? Uh, today, uh, we rely on our human interaction, the int intuition, and uh, come up with ways to do this. I put this process together, this piece, this piece put together with that piece. I string together a 500 step process to make this thing. Right, that's great, but is that the only way? Well, I don't know. There would be many other ways, especially when you put into the mix of different, let's say you want to etch something, there are five different tools that can do the etch. Which tools do I use? Which tool can do the thing that I wanted to do? So that's similar to what you do going from uh, Stanford to Berkeley. There are many routes to get there, which ways is better. So in the future, uh, that would be, that we, after we learn enough about and develop uh, the digital twin for all the unit processes and, uh, and, manage, and, and how they get strung together in the processes, we should be able to do a query and say, I want to get there. What is the best way to get there? And that would really change the way we design processes and, and, and the, uh, develop new technology, how to get from A to B. So I call this uh, Google Fab. Okay, so we, in the future, we should be able to have enough understanding about the processes itself and how to string the processes together so that if I want to go from A to B, I arrive at a new the technology, I should be able to query some big model in here and get started right away. And that would really short, uh, have a really uh, important, uh, really good shortcut into developing the technology. So that's all I want to say. And um, now, as you recognize, uh, computing is not AI, but AI needs computing. And no, there's no, compute, no AI, AI without computing. And without chips, there's no computing. But the chips, making the chips require AI also, as I just spent the last uh, 10 minutes for, uh, with you. So we need each, each other, and I'm hoping that in the future this is going to be a happy family with AI, computing, and chips manufacturing all helping each other out. Thank you. So any questions? Dr. Wang is open to answering any questions between you and lunch. <laughs> Uh, the question was how to build the education base for the U.S. industry. This gets to my favorite uh, 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 topic because my product is student, okay? <laughs> so you may be building your own product, my product is student, okay? How do you build the, the, the uh, education base? Uh, just like your product, building your product, what do you think about supply and demand, okay? Uh, I'm on the supply side. I, I teach courses, I train students. I need the demand signals. Okay, students respond to demand signals. And just to give an example, see these days, a lot of companies are designing their own chips. So they need circuit designers. The students taking circuit design class are skyrocketing. Okay, so students react to demand signal. Uh, so it's very important to have a healthy industry if you want people. If, you, if your industry is not healthy, people are not gonna come. If I'm a graduate, st graduating student and the semiconductor industry is laying off people left and right, am I going to go join a company with semiconductors? No. Right? So you have to have a very healthy industry. So innovators, entrepreneurs, wonderful. You create a healthy industry, students will come. 
The cost of manufacturing a chip in Taiwan is much cheaper. Why would any manufacturer open a factory in the U.S.? Okay, the question is, uh, I guess you, you heard that uh, the cost of manufacturing of chips in Taiwan is cheaper than in the U.S. Why would, I, why would some company open a, a, a factory in the U.S.? Uh, geopol geopolitics, right? uh, people want to be uh, de-risking, and so, so they want to move manufacturing closer, localize the manufacturing, so the countries like to do that. So that's really the ba ba main reason. Gotcha. Okay, so the question was, uh, do we think that we have the foundational uh, knowledge to stu for the students, uh, even before they come to college, to consider semiconductor as a, as a, as a, uh, as a career, right? So uh, if I could quote some, uh, some uh, statistics, right? The number of students who are taking, uh, who are in STEM fields, uh, science, technology, engineering, math, right, STEM fields. The number of students who, ha who are in STEM fields all of, over the past 20 years in the U.S. has been steadily increasing. So the number of students who are prepared and trained in STEM has not decreased in the U.S. Now you may ask, why, why, why are we having this news about technician shortage and people shortage? It's because those people go to other industries. So the number of the available talent is there. It's just that they are not choosing this particular industry. That goes back to the answer to the other questions that I asked, uh, that I answered the other, uh, the other uh, uh, person, is that why are they not choosing this industry? It's because this industry is not healthy enough in the US. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you.